Welcome to Pathways Research and Training Center's June 21st webinar, Affirmative CBT, Supporting the Mental Health of LGBTQ Plus Youth. I'm John Southey, Director of Dissemination for Pathways, and I'd like to begin with a few housekeeping announcements. Please see the advice on this slide to make the most of your go-to meeting experience. In particular, please note that during the presentation, all audience members will be muted, but you can send your questions to us via the chat feature. A recording of this webinar will be made available online shortly after the webinar ends and will be available from the link shown below. We would also like to invite everyone who has registered for this webinar to stay in touch with Pathways RTC by signing up for our monthly newsletter, the RTC Updates. We feature links to Pathways resources like this webinar as well as news and events of interest to the field. You'll receive an invitation via email after the webinar and we hope that you will accept it. This webinar was made possible through funding from SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Sub Services Administration, and NIDLR, the National Institute on Stability, Independent Living, and Rehabilitation Research. And with that, I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, Affirmative CBT, Supporting the Mental Health of LGBTQ Plus Youth. Our panelists today will be Ashley Austin, who is an Associate Professor and Director of the Center for Human Rights and Social Justice at Barry University. Shelley Craig, who is Associate Professor and Associate Dean, an Academic and Canada Research Chair in Sexual and Gender Minority Youth, both of whom will be discussing affirmative CBT, and Emmy Hinkle, an Independent Living and My Life Coach at New Avenues for Youth, as well as an alumni of foster care who will be setting the context for this webinar by sharing her own story with us. But first, let's learn a little bit about you, our audience. We have a few quick polls for you. and. Well, I'm going to put the first one up right now. And let's see, we'll have a few seconds to vote for it. OK. So this poll is basically asking you your role. And uh, we've got just a few more seconds to vote, just a quick little um, chance for us to get to know a little bit more about the perspective you're coming to uh, this webinar with and hopefully our panelists can use that to tailor their responses. So we have about five more seconds. We've already got more than a quorum. Okay, great. Well, let's see what we've got. And not surprisingly to me, most folks here are service providers or managers. Um, we have some evaluators and family members as well. So we welcome everyone to this webinar, and hopefully this is good information for our panelists. We'd like to ask another poll, just to keep things going, about your experience with LGBTQ plus youth. So if you wouldn't mind, let letting us know a little bit more about that. And we'll have about 10 more seconds or so for voting. Um, you can see there are some choices. We understand there may be overlap here, so you can vote from up to two. OK. And we'll wrap this up really quickly. I think most people have voted already. Thanks for being so responsive today. And we're going to close the poll here. And let's share the responses. And as we can see, um, looks like most people have some experience working with LGBTQ plus youth on occasion. We have some who identify as uh, LGBTQ plus young adults. Um, and we have a, quite a number that actually work with them often or daily and who are advocates. So again, welcome to all of you. This is very good information to know. And one last poll before we move on to uh, Emmy's pre part of the presentation here. I'd like to, let's see, hide this one. And then ask you one last question, and this is a good segue to Emmy's uh, presentation today. So um, have, has anyone heard of or has an experience with what's so-called conversion therapy? 
Uh, have you heard about it? Uh, do you know something about it? Um, we have a few more seconds for voting on this issue. All right, and we'll wrap up the voting here in about five seconds. It looks like most everyone has voted. And I'm really pleased to see that we've got about 100 people joining us today, so that's very encouraging. OK, so we're going to close the poll and share the results. And it looks like a, a majority have very little knowledge, but they've heard of it. Um, and some folks do know something about it or, or quite a bit. So with that, uh, I think I'd like to turn things over now to Emmy Hinkle. Um, and Emmy, would you take it away for us, please? Yeah, thank you, Joe. Um, so just to start, since we just did that poll question, I was just going to read a little bit from the American Psychological Association about conversion therapy, um, just so we can kind of start off there. So they say that sexual orientation conversion therapy refers to counseling and psychotherapy to attempt to eliminate individual sexual desires for members of their own sex. There's also ex-gay ministry, which refers to religious groups that use religion to attempt to eliminate those desires. Typically, sexual orientation conversion therapy is prom promoted by providers who have close ties to religious institutions and organizations. Some religion-based organizations, such as Focus on the Family, have invested significant resources in the promotion of sexual orientation conversion therapy and ex-gay ministries to educate. Hey, Emmy, I'm really sorry to interrupt you, but we're having a real hard time hearing you. You're sort of cutting out a little bit. Um, such as myself, we've heard it called different things, or when we experienced, uh, uh, you know, heard of it at all um, in those terms. And so um, when we talk about conversion therapy, sometimes a youth is experiencing it in a way that um, they would not call it conversion therapy, they wouldn't call it reparative therapy, they would just understand that the you know, desires that they are expressing or hiding um, are something that others are not Oh, sorry, Emmy, we've lost you again. Um, are you there with us, Emmy? Accepting of, and so this is especially prevalent for LGBTQ youth um, who are in disadvantaged situations such as HS15. And this was in Casper, Wyoming, and um, I was living in a hoarder home with my uh, biological family, and um, I had reached out actually to friends that I knew saying that I think that I'm in a bad situation and I need to get out of the home and so I sought out foster care knowing that it would probably be better than the home I was growing up in. Um, so they were able to help me get into foster care. Um, I also started going to church around the same time looking for a community that could support me emotionally. Um, but all through this time I was closeted as gay and just hadn't really considered even thinking about coming out with that at that point. So I entered CARE, and it was the summer between middle and high school, um, and so I was just getting ready to start a new school, and in that summer I was entering a new foster home. Um, that one only worked for about the summer, and then I moved into my next home, and that one worked out for a very long time, and I had a great foster mom who I still have contact with today. Um, the Christian family environment that I was looking for was something I'd found in the church that I went to. Um, but I was still closeted and was pretty clear about where they stood with that without them really having to say anything. Um, Wyoming being pretty conservative and Republican, it wasn't really um, the most accepting environment. So while my mom was also, my foster mom was really uh, um, a great person, re religion kind of made things um, a situation where I felt like we could get along when it came to Christian faith, but I didn't really feel like if I were to come out that would be a safe option option for me, so I didn't ever really talk to her about that. Um, and then my biological family, one of my parents was transitioning from male to female. At the time, because I was so involved with faith and less in touch with my sexuality, um, I was more struggling even with my parent being trans versus seeing that as an opportunity to find acceptance. Um, and later our relationship was mended, but at the time it was uh, strenuous knowing that my religious community wasn't supportive of her transition either. Um, so when I graduated high school, um, I got a full ride scholarship to go to college. It was the Daniel Spun Scholarship. 
And um, I spent the summer getting to know a woman in my church. Um, I was 18 going on 19, and I was going to be exiting foster care on my 19th birthday. And as I got to know this woman in my church, um, we just got emotionally close. And the closer we got, the more um, the leadership in our church, um, I think, started to notice that we were getting closer. And right before I turned 19, just a few days before that, they sat us down and told us that we they knew what was going on and that we couldn't know each other anymore more and had started what you could consider conversion therapy or ex gay therapy or just in general wanting to protect the church and saying that through love they wanted to protect us and so stop what was going on. Um, and so the same community that I was seeing as family was telling me that no, we w we're not going to accept you as you are. And so that was really a struggle and I chose faith over my sexuality at that time because I didn't really know what else I would do. So I um, wasn't allowed to see that person anymore, and so I had weekly meetings with church leadership. Um, I had to look at scripture a lot. I had to talk about what I was thinking and if I was or wasn't thinking about this other person or just in general having um, thoughts that they did not like. Um, and right when I started conversion therapy, I turned 19 and I exited care. So I was living independently in college, which is a great transition but I spent my 19th birthday mostly alone because then at the same time um, I was um, I was having to struggle with now I do, I can't, I'm not next to this person I'm really close to and no one else knows what's going on and I don't feel like I can tell people so it was very isolating right at that same time. Um, so I exited care and I think a lot of people consider foster care is when a lot of bad things happen but I had a, a pretty okay time in care besides being closeted. It was really my pre-foster care experience that was most traumatic and then now you know exiting foster care having an also traumatic and tumultuous time. Um, so I, for about six months, went through conversion therapy, stayed away from this person, um, just really had to get closer and closer to the leadership that was um, making me feel very shameful about myself. And so um, that was a struggle, but I stuck with it as much as I could, hoping to figure out how to be straight, but more and more I felt like that, that wasn't going to happen. So um, I was being threatened to leave my job because I worked at the same um, place as this person um, and they felt that one of us needed to leave so I should because I was younger. Um, they were threatening my scholarship because we were um, attending the same school. She was a teacher and I was a student and um, I was never one of her students. But So a lot of, a lot of things were going on so I was getting pushed farther and farther away by the people who were staying in our family. So I started losing relationships. Um, but finally one friend stepped in and told me that what was happening was looking a lot like blackmail um, of being told that they were protecting this person but really not, you know, helping me figure out how to stay safe and to keep all the things that I really built for myself to be successful. Um, and so I really listened to her and realized that the only way I could do that was I would have to be okay with the fact that the community that I would lean on when I would get a flat tire or needed a place to stay was not going to be there when I came out. So I got a job and I made sure that my car was stable, I made sure I had a stable living so that way I could rent from someone who was non-religious and would be accepting of my sexuality. Um, when all of that was stable I met with church leadership and left um, and then I came out. Um, officially to a lot of friends and I started to find out who was really there for me as me and who um, was not. And that was I think when I started to grow the most. I started to learn more about what I felt like love was versus what I felt had gotten misconstrued in a religious setting. Um, and then I graduated from a community college in Casper and I got two associate's degrees and with my scholarship was able to transfer to Portland State University. Um, and I had gone from the medical field and switched to women, gender, sexuality, queer studies because I wanted to understand something that I had been told uh, I was not supposed to understand and I really wanted to get more familiar with that but still work in foster care work because at the time I was also building up my national foster care experience as an alumni of care. So I continue working on national LGBTQ, especially related to foster youth. Um, I worked at um, the National Resource Center for Youth Development as an intern. I was a foster club outstanding and leader. I um, currently work at the Capacity Building Center for States as a consultant as well as JBS International as a NIDID consultant helping with um, states um, auditing their systems and seeing how they're doing. And I also work now at New Avenues for Youth as a My Life Better Futures coach, a near peer coach working with youth of all different backgrounds who are transition age and helping them learn 
learn skills and hopefully transition successfully um, to whatever their goals are. And that's really where I'm at now. Now I'm um, in two weeks, I'll be marrying my wife, and I'm very excited about that. Um, obviously, conversion therapy uh, didn't, didn't completely ruin my future, and so I'm very excited about the future that's ahead of me, and I'm looking forward to um, hearing with all of you more about um, Affirm. Thank you. Great, Emmy. Thank you so much for that. We did have one quick question for you uh, that came in while you were uh, talking. What type of church did you attend? Um, it was a Christian church, and it was a church that was, um, like, I guess, evangelical, very modern church. Um, yeah, but it was a, just like a non-denominational uh, modern Christian church. Yeah. I see. Okay. Well, thanks for sharing that with us, Emmy. Um, and let's now move on to uh, Affirmative CBT. And I'm going to ask Shelley and Ashley if if they would introduce themselves and start their portion of the presentation. Great. Um, thank you, John. And uh, thank you, Emmy, for that wonderful, um, for sharing your experiences. And certainly congratulations on your upcoming wedding. Um, this is Shelley Craig speaking. And um, I'm from the University of Toronto. And I will be present co-presenting with uh, Ashley Austin from um, uh, School of Social Work, Barry University. And she'll jump in in a minute, so I think I'll just kind of keep moving forward. Um, so we're really excited to share our work on affirmative CBT with you. It's really based on several decades of uh, practice directly in the field, sort of like you all are, right in the field, doing the work. Um, and, and it really counters what we heard, um, I think, as Emmy's experience in terms of uh, conversion therapy. It's almost the antithesis of conversion therapy um, because the intention is to really draw out and support um, the, the gifts and the skills and the, the resiliencies of LGBT plus youth. Um, we will use the term LGBT plus youth. There's a lot of different terms that are out there. That's just the term that we're going to use for this webinar, but certainly um, in uh, certainly, in, you know, input any any terms that make the most sense to you or that you identify with. Uh, next slide, please. So our objectives for our portion of today, again, building on Emmy's wonderful uh, introduction, is really just to let you know a little bit about a firm um, and to help kind of walk you through just a few of the clinical considerations that could be, uh, that are important to effective implementation of a firm. And I'm also going to show you some data, I promise it won't be too boring, really demonstrating that a firm holds promise um, to reduce depression particularly and enhance coping and self-efficacy among LGBT plus youth. And then we'll just talk a little bit about next steps and field your questions. Next slide, please. So just a few fast facts about AFFIRM. So AFFIRM is an eight-session cognitive behavioral intervention really developed to target the unique needs of diverse LGBT plus youth. So we really strive to um, incorporate this idea of promoting positive change and healthy coping through the creation of a safe, affirming, and collaborative therapeutic experience. So it's rooted in the tenets of CBT, which we'll go over just briefly in a moment, and really aims to improve emotional and behavioral functioning, and certainly coping, by targeting some of these underlying cognitions that could be causing stress for the uh, young person. So, and really was developed, as I said before, to counter the harmful, and we certainly know unethical, uh, conversion therapies, and um, we do have a statement which is in our resource uh, list at the end um, that uh, we have created through the Council on Social Work Education, really making a strong stance, encouraging social workers to take a strong stance against uh, conversion therapies. So these conversion therapies, again, in keeping with Emmy's experience, really tend to pathologize LGBT plus identities and coercively sometimes it's implicitly, sometimes it's very explicitly, really try to change minority sexual orientations and or gender identities. Next slide, please. So just a little bit about the development of a firm, because um, often folks are kind of, where did it come from? Did it just show up at a university one day? So we really used an adapt and evaluate framework, which is a framework that we like. Um, it really enhances cultural congruence 
of interventions that are targeting minority subgroups. So in this case, LGBT plus youth. So we started uh, very iteratively, iteratively. We started with focus groups uh, with youth, and this is a lot of work that uh, we did probably starting about uh, five or six years ago. We started with focus groups with youth and providers to try to understand what exactly affirmative content and procedures would look like from the perspective of the experts, which are the youth and the people who are doing the service delivery. Um, then we created and sort of adapted an interven intervention manual. We infused, we're just calling queer affirmative content content at this point, but LGBT plus affirmative content. Then we did an open pilot feasibility study, which I'll report on a little bit later. Um, then we went back and refined the manual based on what we learned from kind of using this intervention in the field a few times. And then we're now working on sort of a larger scale quasi-experimental or RCT design to try to really prove the efficacy more broadly and ensure that a firm gets out to a large population. Uh, next slide, please. So some affirmative tenets are that um, a firm was created using community member and youth uh, input, and it's uh, developed to ensure an affirming stance towards sexual and gender di diversity. So this is sort of the lens that we use. Recognition and awareness of sexual and gender identity specific sources of stress. Trans, for example, I mean there's a range, but transphobia, uh, maybe homophobia, heterosexism. And very much a youth-centric orientation that recognizes and attends to the uh, unique experiences of navigating these identities while also navigating adolescence or young adulthood, because it's challenging. Either one of those are often challenging, as we certainly know. Um, and how to deliver CBT content within an affirming framework. The perception is that CBT is not always, but certainly it can be within an affirming framework that really attends to the intersectionality of identity-based experiences. And we'll talk about the range of identities that did participate in uh, our pilot intervention. Next slide, please. So what, what we do know, and you know this from your work and certainly from any of the literature that's out there, that there are many, multi and, and as well as Emmy's, Emmy's experiences, there are many, multi there are many uh, mental health stressors that LGBT plus youth experience, poor levels of coping for many, not all, higher risk of, of a number of health risk sexual behaviors or other health risk behaviors. And often these vulnerabilities are based in, so we want to be very clear with our affirm intervention that these vulnerabilities are not internally based with the youth, but they're very much externally based, related um, and, and in many ways caused by um, the unfriendly or hostile climates and stigma that these youth are experiencing, homes, schools, and communities, in many cases still the media, which is really what's known as minority stress, a specific type, type of stress that folks experience. So, um, and so a critical component of a firm is that it's grounded in an understanding of the stigma and that that's the reality of, uh, that that's the reality of lived experience for these folks. Next slide, please. So just a little bit more about a, uh, our the reason why a firm is really a community-based intervention instead of something that's, that's um, just uh, housed in maybe a medical setting, for example, or in, um, at a university. So what we do know, and again, 20 years of delivering services for LGBT plus youth, um, I certainly am aware of this, that there's a lack of evidence-informed interventions for youth, for these youth that are certainly created in partnership with community, really grounded in an understanding of what it's like to deliver mental health and health services today, systematically developed through practice-based research to enhance the, um, the practice toolbox, and then holistic, so focused on the intersection between the psychosocial factors and mental health. Um, so these are, these are sort of important. We know that a lot of youth do not um, access our, some of our more traditional uh, services that we might offer for mental health. So LGBT plus youth living with depression, may be, may, it may be better to take the intervention to them, um, and they might be better served by school or community-based programs that can disrupt the, their dis distress, and we know that youth are already going to many of these community-based groups, and skills training, um, this is something that comes out of NIH, but skills training should really do be delivered in natural settings 
because community-based approaches tend to be more cost-effective and efficacious. So, and they, again, may capture youth that are in not that are in other systems of care. Um, okay, next slide, please. And I think at this point, I will turn it over to Ashley to introduce herself and uh, kind of go through our next phase. Thanks, Shelley. Hi, um, this is Ashley. Hope everybody can hear me okay. So what we're going to do now is move into um, a little bit more of an explanation of, of what a firm is. Um, we've talked a little bit about how we've developed it and, and some of those things. And we're going to talk a little bit about what it is and how we implement it. So um, first, as uh, Shelley mentioned, it's based on the CBT model. And CBT is based on cognitive theory. So the idea that uh, people's emotions and behaviors are influenced by the way um, in which they perceive events. So the situation itself doesn't determine how we feel, it's the way we interpret and think about things. So this is the frame for, for how we work with youth and help them understand their own feelings and behaviors. All right, next slide, please. So this is just a little, a little model to help, help anybody. And I know there's a wide range of you, and some of you may have experience with CBT and others not. So we're going to kind of go over um, stuff so everybody's on the same page. But here's a little, bit mo a little model about um, how thoughts affect feelings. So um, thoughts lead to feelings, feelings impact our behaviors, and behaviors, good or bad, continue to reinforce those thoughts. So it's very cyclical. So the idea is if the young person is thinking there's something inherently wrong with me, uh, especially when they're getting that message from the world, the feelings are, you know, I feel worthless, I feel unlovable. And the behaviors that often accompany those negative uh, thoughts and feelings are isolating, using substances, high-risk sexual behaviors, other kinds of uh, things that are, that are not so helpful and not so safe. Um, so this is sort of the, the framework for understanding what we're doing. And we'll move to the next slide, please. OK, so here are um, just some basic principles of CBT, um, just general CBT. We're going to get into a little bit more later on our affirmative principles, but these are just CBT principles. So the first piece is that we conceptualize the client and their problems or issues in cognitive terms, starting with the thoughts. Um, CBT does require an important therapeutic alliance, and we talk about what that looks like for LGBTQ plus kids. Um, CBT really emphasizes the collaborative process, especially a firm. Um, it's goal-oriented. It initially focuses on the present and tries to stay in the present a lot, although we will um, often look at some of the messaging that we've received either in our families, our schools, our, our, our religious institutions, and how that affects our present day thinking. Um, CBT teaches clients how to be their own therapist so that they can continue to work on things well after treatment is over. It is uh, tends to be time limited, very brief, or up to some, you know, sometimes up to 24 sessions, but often much briefer like ours. Sessions are structured. Um, CBT helps clients identify, evaluate, and respond to unhelpful thoughts and beliefs. So it really teaches clients how to manage their own unhelpful thinking patterns and change them. And it uses a number of techniques or strategies to change thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. And we're going to go over several relevant ones today. Um, OK, we'll move to the next slide. OK, so here are some goals of a firm. Um, Basically, our premise is we want to help young people decrease their unhelpful thoughts so that they can feel better about themselves and their lives, and they can learn to cope in ways that support healthy behaviors and actions. So that's, a, that's the basic premise of CBT approaches, and that's absolutely what uh, we do in a firm. All right, next slide, please. Importantly, and this is really, I think, what makes um, a firm very different from other CBT approaches. Not that CBT approaches won't do this. This is just not inherent to CBT. This is really inherent to affirmative practice. Um, and it is the foundation for our firm intervention. Basically, um, we, uh, for us, an affirmative framework means that we take a non-pathologizing approach to clinical practice, which accepts and validates all sexual orientations and gender identities and expression. So, you know, clearly this is, as Shelley mentioned, this runs uh, completely counter to conversion and reparative therapies that tend to, that are sort of based um, on shaming uh, LGBT uh, folks and uh, coercing them to change their sexual orientations and gender identities. Affirmative practice is quite the opposite. We celebrate and validate and accept um, 
all experiences of identity. So a firm creates a safe space for clients to explore, understand, and inhabit their own sexual and gender identities. Um, in affirmative practice, we reject the male-female binary, so this idea that gender is just male or female. This is rejected in favor of a, what we think is a much more accurate and nuanced understanding of gender that is a multi-dimensional spectrum. Um, all ways of experiencing and expressing sexual and gender identities are acknowledged as valuable. Um, affirm our affirmative framework recognizes interpersonal, social, institutional, cultural, and political barriers to safety and well-being experienced by LGBT uh, youth and adults. And this is really important. This is really, really um, infused across the firm is this idea that we recognize the external barriers to well-being that are experienced by LGBT young people. That so many of the, of the factors contributing to LGBT health are coming from uh, homophobic and transphobic environments. Our affirmative framework openly acknowledges and works to disrupt heterosexism and cisgender privilege across systems because we know that heterosexism and cisgender privilege really permeates um, all systems, um, you know, schools, religious institutions, and society at large, and we really have to work hard to help dismantle this. Um, okay, we'll move to the next slide. So um, in addition to our affirmative framework, there were very specific considerations um, we took when we were developing our affirmative intervention and our uh, specific model for, for working with young people. First, a firm recognizes that LGBTQ plus youth may develop patterns of negative thinking about themselves as a result of exposure to transphobic and homophobic attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors. Because as we mentioned, CBT is rooted in this idea of a thought. So, you know, negative thinking uh, is sort of unhelpful patterns of thinking. And it is really important that the practitioner understand that these thoughts are quite normal responses to environments um, that, uh, that permeate transphobia and homophobia. So it's sort of um, quite understandable when a young person develops or internalizes some of these uh, thinking patterns. Um, a firm utilizes CBT strategies to target based stressors. So it's really, really specific. We don't just target sort of depression or anxiety more generally. We really look at some identity-based stressors that are really common to emotional distress among LGBT young people. These can include homophobic and transphobic bullying in schools, which we've heard about a lot in, in, our, in our media, family rejection, which we know is a big one, and of course sort of church rejection or, or rejection from spiritual communities or other communities can be really, really traumatic for young people. Um, a firm engages LGBT plus youth in CBT strategies aimed at improving coping related to both internal and external sources of stress. So while we, also, while we acknowledge all these factors, the main tenet of CBT is teaching young people how to cope differently and better. So we really work on that and help young people cope with internal stressors. So things that have internalized and, and as well as external things, things that may be beyond their control, but they still must learn how to cope with them in a safe and effective way. Okay, so we'll move to the next slide, please. Okay, so what we're going to do now is I'm going to give you a bit of an overview of our firm intervention and touch on a couple different strategies and clinical techniques that we use. Try to bring it to life a little bit. We can't go through everything um, in our limited time, but try to give you a little bit of a taste of it. So if we can move to the next slide, I'll give you a sense of what that looks like. Okay, so here we've got, um, there's a two-slide uh, uh, introduction, but these are our eight modules that um, we tend to use in a firm, um, and we used it when we delivered the uh, the intervention that Shelly's going to talk about later when she shared the results. This is the the, the uh, approach we used. So we have eight sessions or eight modules. The first one and two are focused a lot on psychoeducation, which is very common in CBT, right, to, to sort of help young people understand CBT, thoughts, feelings, and actions, as well as to understand, you know, sort of what is depression, what is stress. What is different in our approach is that we really, really help young people understand the concept of minority stress. And minority stress is essentially this idea that young people are overexposed to transphobic and homophobic stress um, and stigmatization that really affects their well-being. And we want young people to understand this cycle as well as the impact of this anti-LGBTQ stress on their own feelings and behaviors. So it's psychoeducation around a couple different LGBT-specific um, issues as well. Um, and then we move on to session three, 
which is um, understanding how thoughts affect feelings. So we teach young people to, to understand how, really clearly the kinds of thoughts they're having, which ones are helpful and which ones are unhelpful. We help them distinguish between thoughts and feelings, and we help them learn to understand how thoughts really create feelings, especially feelings of stress, anxiety, uh, the, you know, depression, um, hopelessness. In session four, we work on helping young people learn this very specific strategy to challenging their thoughts so that they can actually change the way they feel. Okay, we'll move to the next slide, which is uh, where we start our second half. All right, and here we've got sessions uh, five through eight. So in session five, we um, explore how activities or behaviors impact feelings, because for some people it's about once you start doing the right things, even if you're not feeling it, you can learn to change those feelings. And this is uh, sometimes it's called behavioral activation and other kinds of things. So what we do is really work with youth to understand which kinds of feelings um, make them feel worse about themselves, which ones help them feel better, and we really work on um, helping them engage in the activities that, that um, promote positive feelings. Num uh, session six, we focus on uh, more of strategies for overcoming unhelpful uh, thoughts and feelings in the long run, planning for the future, setting goals, um, and having uh, more positive thinking about the future. Seven, we move into understanding the impact of stress and minority stress and anti-LGBTQ stress on social relationships, family relationships, friendships, uh, relationships with potential partners. Um, and what this looks like and what, what when young people have been holding back or being um, prevented from living full, authentic lives. We look at the, the impact of this and, and help them learn to live authentically and to be assertive and respond in healthy ways to this discrimination. Finally, in session eight, what we know is very important for LGBT youth is to have a very strong, supportive um, social network, a social network that affirms their identities, that is very supportive to them as whole individuals, not just, you know, sort of Annie mentioned um, being supported in her religious identity, but not in her sexual orientation. And young people deserve to be uh, supported across um, all dimensions of self and for exactly who they are. And so we really work on helping them come up with safe and supportive networks to sustain them long after our program is over. So that's what it looks like in a nutshell. Um, and obviously you have these slides, so you can look at this in more detail and, and, and get a, a better sense of kind of what we do in each session. Um, and it can be tweaked slightly, but this is just a really good overview of what, what works. We'll move on to the next slide, please. So here's just some examples of the kinds of questions one might ask when, when you are doing um, a cognitive conceptualization. So you remember from the earlier slide, that's one of the key pieces of CBT. Well, it's a cognitive conceptualization is like an interactive or uh, sort of collaborative assessment. It starts in session one and continues throughout the course of, of the program so that you know the client and the clinician are constantly on the same page in terms of what's going on and what they're working on and where they're moving. So some of the questions that uh, may be asked during this phase with LGBTQ uh, youth is um, sort of what early learning experiences about sexual orientation or gender identity or LGBTQ people contribute to current problems or current sources of stress. Um, what are the client's underlying beliefs and thoughts about themselves, about their identity, um, about the world and their future? How does the client cope with any unhelpful beliefs? What is their current strategy for coping? Is it helpful or not so helpful or 50-50? What does it look like? What are they doing to cope now? How does the client view self and others? So how do they view themselves in comparison to others? How do they view other, other LGBT people? Does client have hope for the future? We know that LGBT um, young people have particularly high rates of suicidality, and we know that hopelessness is one of the primary predictors of suicidality. So we really want to understand what clients hope for the future looks like. Um, and also, what current stresses are interfering with the client's ability to solve current problems? What's getting in the way of effective coping? And so when we know these things, we can really begin to um, tailor the treatment and the interventions to really meet each specific uh, client's needs. All right, we'll move uh, forward from here. 
Okay, the law, I know there's a lot on this slide, so uh, you know you can look at it at your leisure later. Um, but what this is is we wanted to provide an example for you about some of the strategies we use for responding affirmatively to LGBTQ specific discrimination. We've mentioned this a lot. It's sort of really our program is rooted in, in understanding this discrimination and countering it. Um, but what does that look like? So we wanted to just give some examples of what we think it looks like. So for, there's a couple sample scenarios. I'll go over the first one, for example. A young person reports being uh, stared at and laughed at while grocery shopping. Maybe they are gender nonconforming youth. Um, we know lots of, uh, that trans and gender nonconforming youth get uh, stared at and gawked at often. We also know that same-sex couples often get uh, teased, especially young people, teased in public. So that's the scenario we threw out there, and we want uh, clinicians to avoid sort of universalizing these kinds of experiences and saying something like, everyone gets stared at sometimes. This kind of response is very minimizing and often and tends to come across as negating the reality of homophobic or transphobic discrimination, very unhelpful. Instead, we really want to encourage clinicians to work hard to acknowledge the discrimination and validate the feelings, the often very painful feelings that accompany such experiences. So say something instead like, it must be painful to be stared and gawked at when you're just trying to go about your day. And a lot of these examples that we provide are from real life experiences that our clients have shared with us. Um, so um, for example, the bottom one would be, uh, again, a sort of a normalizing, uh, we wouldn't want folks to normalize the discrimination. So a client shares feelings that he has not been called back for interviews at the mall or other places because employers noted that the legal, his legal name was not consistent with his gender presentation. So maybe he had uh, a, a, his birth name still on his driver's license, but he was presenting as fairly, very male. So instead of saying finding a good job is tough for many, many folks or many kids these days, we really don't find that helpful. Instead, it's really important to acknowledge and name transphobic specific barriers that are out there and that are impacting the lives of, of young people. Obviously, same example for homophobic or barriers that are that are happening. But so you might say something like, "It feels really unfair and discouraging to you that you continue to be passed over for jobs because of other people's transphobic attitudes and hiring practices." So really helping um, name the discrimination, put words and put it out there how difficult and painful and really unjust and unfair it is. Um, so these are some examples. You know, peruse them at your leisure later. We will move to the next slide to give another example, please. OK, so here's another example. Some of you, if anybody's familiar with a CBT, might have seen this before. But this is a very standard way for challenging negative thinking and internalized maybe homophobic or transphobic thinking through the ABCD method. So this is a method for really teaching young people to challenge and talk back to those negative thoughts. Those thoughts that are really, really unhelpful. So I will. There's a couple different examples here. I'll go over example number two. So for instance, a young person, and this is sort of in line with some of the messaging that a young person might get from parents who have um, been um, taught that um, being gay is not OK and who bought into that in, in the same way that and this, um, church family and some of the church folks that she was exposed to earlier in her life were passing on these kinds of messages. So the event is that my father told me I'm going to hell because I'm gay. So that's the situation. It's a fact. That's happened. The next piece is the belief. This is the young person's belief or thought around that. So you get the young person to articulate their thought. My father hates me and wishes I wasn't born. Maybe I am going to hell for being gay. There is something wrong with me. So these are really uh, thoughts that are really unhelpful and lead to feelings um, in C, which are, I feel really sad, scared, angry, despondent, hopeless. We can go on and on um, about the ways in which those kinds of thoughts might impact a young person. So usually young people can come up with those pretty easily. The challenge is often D, which is when we're going to dispute or talk back to the thought. So sometimes this is where we as clinicians step in and really help a client. Other times, they're, they're great at coming up with this. And they don't need to come up with as many as we did. Um, they just need to come up with a couple that really help them see things in a different way. So for example, here we've got, you know, I'm not going to hell and there is nothing wrong with me. Or the thought, you know, this other, you know, refuted thought. There are many religions and religious viewpoints that honor, validate, and embrace all people and all identities. 
Um, another option, gay people are as worthy and valuable as people with other sexual identities. And my father is just angry and confused about me being gay because he doesn't understand. He may need some time and help to figure these things out. So not all of these will work for each person, but the, the, the key is to help the young person generate alternative explanations that really make sense to them, new ways of thinking about the situation that are less hopeless and less, um, unhelp less uh, more helpful, that promote positive coping and, and more hope for the future. Um, so um, hopefully this is helpful and this kind of approach works really well for CBT and young people are able to pick up on it quite quickly and you know, it takes a little while for them to practice it, but they're able to get the gist and then sometimes you give it as homework, sometimes you continue to practice in group um, and they learn to, to uh, automatically challenge their thinking when it comes up. All right, we'll move to the next one. So as we mentioned, um, some activities are helpful and some aren't. And some of the ways that folks can challenge their negative feelings and thinking is by just doing. So this is about helping young people identify activities that support them. As we know, young people will be in a, you know, at a range of stages of coming out. They will be um, in a range of families or social circumstances. They can be out in different ways or access services in different ways. So we want to make sure these are tailored to the needs and the safety of each client. But here are some examples. So you know, schedule time with affirming people. That could be actually going out with a supportive ally or an LGBTQ friend. Or if going out's not an option, then a phone call or FaceTime or Skyping or whatever makes sense. Um, given that youth circumstances. Visit LGBTQ affirming places. This um, may be a, a possibility. So you as a clinician, making sure you know your local resources so you can help connect to local community centers or trans-specific support groups or LGBTQ affirming neighborhoods or restaurants. Um, schedule identity affirming activities. So this might be something big, like going to an LGBT workshop or conference or something that they can do at home alone. If they're not yet ready to be out in public, something simple like visiting uh, YouTube channels, which are very helpful for a lot of folks who have community, virtual community rather than um, locally based community. They might, it might be something as simple as, as streaming LGBTQ affirming movies, reading a positive memoir. So again, as a clinician, being aware of the existing resources and helping young people at their various stages of coming out access these helpful um, activities. And then, of course, we know that um, we want young people to be their own ad advocates and learn to um, advocate for themselves and um, take part in building community and, um, and becoming, um, so this might be something huge like joining an equality group and, and marching or, um, you know, advocating. Or it might be attending events or walking in a parade or, or sitting silently, um, observing a day of silence. So helping young people assert the, themselves and their identities in ways that um, develop their agency and uh, build their self-efficacy. So we'll move to the, the last slide for me, I believe, I think. Oh, that was it. So that was my last slide. And now what we're going to do is turn this again over to Shelly so she can share um, some of the evidence when we have implemented these approaches, um, what we found out. So. Uh, over to you, Shell. Thank you, Ashley. Great. So I'm just going to fairly rapidly go through um, a uh, our open the results of our open pilot feasibility study, um, so you can get a sense of the youth that participated and what the outcomes were. You'll see part of the uh, hand created uh, art that was part of our recruitment strategy for this particular intervention study. So the youth really responded well to that. Next slide, please. So this is just a little picture of one of the breakout groups, um, but we did an eight. Uh, we did a pilot implementation of an eight of the eight module affirm intervention um, in the summer of 2014 um, at an LGBTQ plus center in Toronto. Next slide, please. So these are the youth that participated uh, in our open pilot feasibility study. We had um, youth between the ages of 15 and 18. Um, which was our intended age group, so specifically uh, some certain developmental stages. And again, this is Canadian-specific data, but I think it gives us an idea. Most were born in Canada, um, but 71% reported at least one newcomer or immigrant parent, so again, in terms of the diversity of life experiences. 
this fourth point is an important one. Most were accessing other LGBT plus or queer youth services. So most of them were using other services, which I think is great because there should be. This is not the case in many communities. This happens to be the case in this particular community for some youth. Um, but it's wonderful that there are other uh, services that youth were actually uh, utilizing. But those services provided different, uh, in many ways, different kind of safe spaces, for example, which is great. But for many youth, they also they wanted that, but they also wanted to learn how to build skills to deal with stress. So. That, I think, is something to say, uh, to talk about the importance of having a diversity of service, um, services available. So, and youth had high rates of self-reported depression, um, and nearly a third of the participants had previously attempted suicide. Next slide, please. So this is just a range of identities. So again, in keeping with the idea of delivering um, programs in community, we are often, as someone who did this for many years, we need to be available and we need to be ready to serve um, evidence. We need to deliver evidence-based programs uh, or evidence-informed programs if we have them to a variety of youth. So you'll see uh, youth, these are non-mutually exclusive uh, categories, so this gets to some of the intersectionality, but youth tended to be slightly uh, more identified as female and queer, and, and uh, you'll note that queer is in both of these, that's part of the youth uh, part of our youth advisory board uh, request. And then youth identified slightly more as pansexual, um, as well as uh, lesbian and uh, a number of others. Next slide, please. Just in terms of uh, racial and ethnic identities, uh, again, non-mutually exclusive. So most youth identified as Caucasian and often something else. So we have a range of uh, participant uh, demographics there. Next slide, please. So we did ask uh, some questions about lifetime risk factors, again, to understand them. And just a couple I will highlight. Um, high levels of self-reported anxiety, which mapped onto the data we have, as well as the depression. Um, so uh, again, similar to the clinical measures. And a number of other, again, problem sleeping, which is sort of interesting, um, but related, of course, to the anxiety. Uh, next slide, please. And again, a few more. Um, that most youth had experienced, not most, but some youth had experienced some level of abuse, um, particularly emotional abuse. And this is, of course, similar to many of the clinical um, and community-based samples that we tend to work with. And many of them reported alcohol use or drug use to cope with some of the stressors that they were, my, their minority stress. And lifetime, um, almost half had experienced one bout, I'll just call it that, or one experience of homelessness. So that's something to think about. Okay. Next slide, please. I have to go through these fairly rapidly. So what we found in, times of re in terms of results. So we have some great measures, for example, um, and that's certainly in our paper, but the Beck's Depression Inventory, which is a highly well-regarded scale. So we found um, between pretest and the post-test that uh, youth experienced a significant reduction in depression. And what is really the foundation of CBT is really also this idea of um, we want to help people understand the stress that they're encountering and place it outside of themselves in many ways. So this is the idea of stress appraisal. And so threat appraisal decreased significantly. So seeing, seeing um, uh, all levels, see, seeing stress essentially as a threat, seeing stress as a challenge increased and whether, identifying whether or not they had the resources to meet this particular challenge increased significantly as well. So we're very happy about that breakdown. Um, and we also saw an increase in reflective coping, uh, which again maps on to sort of the, the focus of CBT in terms of being very thoughtful of what it is that um, we are, are, how we're dealing with our particular coping strategies and reactions to stress. Next slide, please. So acceptability and satisfaction, just go through a couple of these. So we had high levels of satisfaction um, and uh, program acceptability. So most youth indicated that um, they learned how to deal with stress and they would use that what they learned from a firm to deal with some of the problems in their lives. So this sort of idea of behavioral intention. Um, they felt that the program was re relevant, very CBT specific question. 90% felt a firm helped them understand how feelings, actions, and thoughts are connected. Um, they were very comfortable participating and would recommend a firm. And in terms of some qualitative comments, these are just a few. 
but they liked the fact that they learned specific tools to deal with stress. They weren't just talking. They were actually learning some specific tools. Um, that it was targeted to them, seemed to be made for queer youth in their lives. And um, they, one per participant said it restored their faith in humanity, which is, was not one of our objectives, but I'm really, great, I'm really glad this uh, young person had that particular experience. Um, and we were also surprised but um, encouraged that youth actually really liked the manual. They also got copies of the, of the manual. So, um, so that was helpful. Next slide, please. So just in terms of implications, so our, this data, so the results of this study, sort of suggest that a firm is effective and acceptable and certainly feasible for addressing uh, critical mental health concerns within LGBT plus youth and young adults. It's one of the only um, LGBT plus youth specific interventions with demonstrated empirical support and really we think hopefully sets a standard for these types of interventions because it really underscores the importance of intentionally infusing an affirmative framework that is inclusive of and attendant to the variety of diverse gender and sexual identities, as well as commitment to empirically supported strategies for positive change, which is CBT. So next slide, please. So in terms of our, um, in terms of strategies for implementing affirmative CBT, there's a lot that you can do. Certainly, um, we have a lot of our articles and additional information on our newly launched uh, affirmative research site. Um, so maybe identify whether or not an affirmative CBT intervention might be helpful in your setting. Could it, would it be helpful to add that to your toolbox of programs or interventions that you are delivering? Seek out additional training specifically on affirmative CBT. I think that's helpful, as well as working with LGBT plus youth and CBT in general. Next slide, please. So um, I, we just want to thank, uh, we had some funders, CIHR, and our wonderful youth participants, our youth advisory board, our community advisory board. We work very closely with groups here. Next slide, please. And if you have any uh, questions or ideas, again, you'll get a copy of this PowerPoint. This is a lot of our information. Um, we would love to be able to chat with you about that further if we can't get to it uh, now during the webinar Q&A. Next slide, please. And this is just a list of references as well as the next slide. You can go to that. Um, that may be helpful that, that we've been using sort of in our research. So thank you so much. Great. Thank you very much, Shelley and, uh, and Ashley and Emmy. Um, we're at about four minutes left of our webinar today, and we've received a number of questions. And I just want to assure everybody that if we don't get to answer your question on the air today, uh, when you asked your question, it was recorded with your email address, so we will be able to respond to you after the webinar. We've also got a number of questions about uh, where to access the slides, and, and so I'm actually going to just advance to this slide so you can see the URL where you will be able to um, get the slides from. So uh, in terms of the questions that came in, I would like to ask the first one to Emmy. Um, okay. Emmy, this one came in and, and the questioner asks, what advice would you uh, give service providers who may encounter youth e either foster care, runaway and homeless youth settings or other systems about how to best invite a youth in a psychologically safe manner to share their LGBTQ plus identity in order to connect with uh, youth to affirmative supports? So what advice would um, you have think... for providers? That's such a small question. <laughs> Kidding. <laughs> Um, I think that a huge part of anything that I've learned is relationships make a huge difference. So taking the time to genuinely get to know someone and letting them share about themselves on their own terms. Um, if you really feel it's necessary to ask someone about their identity, I would make sure that you feel like it is the right time. But otherwise, I would take the time to get to know that person on their own terms. And then as you're building that relationship, I imagine it would come out. But they have to know that they can trust you, that it's safe to tell you, that it's not a huge risk to open up about themselves. And once they know that or that you're a safe space or however you want to go about that, I think that opens up the door easily to here are the resources I know about. And often you can also just share resources you know about. So if the youth wants to share that with you, they know that you're a person that's already on board and will help them as best as you can. But that's um, one thing I've learned with youth that I'm working with. Okay, great. Thank you. 
Um, let's see, another question we got was um, finding more information about the ADAPT and Evaluate framework. Um, is that available from the Affirmative CBT website? It should, sorry, this is Shelley. Um, yes, it should be. Um, so it is in uh, one of our articles that is there. Um, but if you send me a specific email, um, I can also send you the, uh, the article that could be helpful for you in understanding that framework. Great, OK. And we'll make sure it that. Also is, sorry, it's also in the reference list um, mm -hmm. as well. I, t I believe I teary on. Uh, what is the author? Okay, great. And um, I just want to reassure everybody that we're probably going to have to answer most of these questions offline just because we are running out of time very quickly. Uh, so I'm going to ask a, a quick question, uh, just basically about the statistics that were presented. All the percentages are from a sample size of n equals 30. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Or Yes. Okay, great. And and I believe we are at 10.30 at this point, so we're going to have to uh, get back to folks via email. I just wanted to thank everybody for their participation today, um, and that anyone's unanswered questions will be answered uh, from one of us uh, via email. You will be able to receive the PowerPoint slides from the links, uh, uh, sorry, the link that's shown on your screen right now. That's pathwaysrtc.pdx.edu backslash webinars previous. And they should be available this afternoon. Uh, and if any of the panelists have any closing comments, they would be welcomed. Thank I you just for want to thank you, John. Topic. Yeah. Thank <laughs> okay. You. Thanks, everyone, and thanks to our audience too today. Have a great day. Goodbye now. Thank you. Bye.